Thank you, Mr. Seliger. Our next speaker, Maher Abdelgader, has been an activist on behalf of the Palestinian American community for over 15 years. In 1979, he co founded the General Union of Palestinian Students in the USA and was president of the New York chapter from 1981 to 1983. During that period, he also co-founded Arab student clubs at various universities throughout New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. He has been chairman of the board of the American Friends of Palestine since 1987 and is an active member of the Arab American Institute and a member of its presidential circle. In 1995, he co-founded the Palestinian American Congress, dedicated to organizing and informing the Palestinian community and serving as its, lobby, as its representative in this country in the public sphere. Mr. Abdel Ghadir was a member of the Palestinian delegation to the UN's 50th anniversary celebration and has been a guest speaker at many universities throughout the US and the Middle East. Mr. Thank Abdel Ghadir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. And I'm going to try to take 10 to 15 minutes. It's really hard to talk about the Middle East in general because it keeps changing. It changes faster than the weather, especially in New York City. <laughs> Past experiences of Israeli and Arabs proved that the state of belligerence is too costly, both in human and material terms, and therefore cannot continue. Under these premises, the Arabs, especially the Palestinian and the Arabs, and also the Israelis, came together to make peace, to stop bloodshed and human suffering, and in the process to reap the benefits of this peace by raising the standards of living for all, Arabs, Palestinian, Jews, and everybody there. The result was the Oslo One Agreement, which was sealed by the famous handshake on the White House lawn. The United, the United States and Europe were so joyful and proud of the accomplishments of their diplomacy that they promised massive moral and financial support to make this peace work. They painted a glamorous picture of the new land of milk and honey. Unfortunately, little of the, their promises materialized. Two and a half years after signing Oslo One, Many Palestinians seem to be demoralized by their own reality, grim economic conditions, acute shortages of food and medicine, 60 and to 70 percent unemployment, inhumane crowdness, crowdedness, and equal to anywhere in the world in Gaza Strip. In short, People's their experiences are so far no hopes, no dreams, no nothing to look forward to. It's really hard to realize these things, but these are the realities. These are the facts. Then came Oslo II agreement, which was hailed in the West as an honorable and serious move towards peace, when in fact this agreement called for the redeployment of Israeli troops from the centers of towns to their outskirts, giving up roughly 5% of the Palestinian territories, but at the same time, keeping control of exits and entries to all Palestinian towns and control all the roads. Under this agreement, Palestinians were given municipal authorities over those towns and some other villages, but have no right 
to resources, no right to land outside the populated areas, and no authority at all over settlers or settlements. Then came the first Palestinian election, which was widely supported by the international community. The outcome of these elections was clear-cut victory for, the, for President Arafat, confirming him as the undisputed leader of the Palestinian people. But these elections generated such enthusiasm among the Palestinians who for the first time ever in their lives felt a measure of freedom. This was evident by the strong turnout at the poll centers. However, our partners in peace did not forget to remind us of who is in control, both in Jerusalem and Hebron, when the Israeli army intimidated the voters in spite of the presence of approximately 700 representatives from the world community, such as one of them, President Carter. I believe the Palestinian people will con continue to want their rights to be equal, not less, to those of their partners and neighbors, the Israeli people. Peace really means peace between two equal people. It does not mean, okay, other than freedom for both peoples, not just one type of people or a group of people. Not just one, really not just one. No peace for when as a lesser of equality than the other group of people or of a lesser right and security. We always hear about Israeli security, but have, have we ever talked about Palestinian security? Who has the guns? Who has the equipment and the sophisticated machinery? Above all, it means understanding the coherence and <laughs> integrity of our own history as Palestinian and Arabs. Zionist movement, other than, of course, Israelis or Jews, because not every Jew is a Zionist, has always told us our history. I came to the U.S. talking to people. They used to tell me our history, which is different than the way I learned it. Major part of our struggle has been to dis disapprove these kind of myths, all right? We had no presence. We were absent at all time, okay? Non-independent. We always been given the feeling that we are non-independent, okay? But let me tell you some something. We acquired through struggle a modern political identity by virtue of hard work, which was approved or disapproved by other communities. Today, our sense of our own history and past should be more fuller, more critical, more insightful, not, not any less, above all, it should be also told to all, especially to the American. Okay, and the American Secretary of State, Christopher, okay, and to the Israeli government. If we don't take charge of our history, what future, if any, will be left for us to think about or and implement? What? The Palestinians are fed up, really, with the broken promises, unfulfilled hopes, and daily humiliations at the Israeli checkpoints. I believe freedom, loving human beings can understand this. Only loving human beings could understand these things. It's painful. The Israeli people too, 
I don't want to ignore that they themselves provided many sacrifices for peace. From Rabin killing to the latest suicide bombings. It is difficult to understand the pain endured by the victims of the recent suicide bombings in Israel. But this type of pain was, was also experienced by us, the Palestinians, for over 50 years. We know that during the Intifada only, over 2,000 Palestinian lives were lost. 117,000 people got wounded. 138,000 were detained. 7,000 disabled people. 8,000 miscarriages among women in the occupied territories. That is not to say that the latest suicide bombers not only shook the foundation of peace, as they set out to do, but also brought disasters on their families and neighbors. The response of the Israeli government has been equally self-defeating, imposing collective punishment, destroying houses, making sweeping arrests, border closing, and land, land confiscation is more likely to help undermine the Palestinian National Authority position and decribble the peace process and strengthen the opponents of peace on both sides. The emergence of Hamas and Islamic Jihad as part of the continuing protest and should be understood as that. Their suicide missions of defiance of bomb and bomb throwing, sorry, suicide missions, bomb throwing, and provocative slogans are acts of defiance to occupation and worsening conditions of the Palestinian people. But let me remind you of something. Isn't it ironic that Hamas, Hamas, having been encouraged by the state of Israel in the 80s as a tool for breaking the BLO at the time. And they wanted them to help them breaking the Intifada should now be elevated by the, by the government of Israel, okay, to the ranks of super devil. Isn't that, isn't it ironic? And also, isn't it unreasonable for the Israeli to demand that Arafat and the Palestinian National Authority stop acts of violence, knowing that the Israeli government, government themselves were unable to do so, and they have the equipment and the tool and things like that, making the job for the Palestinian National Authority difficult to rule their areas and undermining their authorities will not make the Middle East any safer. Absolutely, it will never make the Middle East any safer. The trauma created by the wave of suicide bombings in Israel has generated a spillover or a spill effect in both the American Jewish community and the pro-Israel leadership in Congress. The bombings have created a pretext for Congress to freeze even the limited, very limited U.S. economic assistance to the Palestinians and to engage in unrestrained Arafat bashing. Since 93, enemies of the Middle East peace process applied systematic pressure on U.S. support for the Palest on the U.S. support for the Palestinians. As a result. U.S. economic assistance to the Palestinian is provided only with a humiliating and encumbering conditions. Now, those who have long opposed this U.S. assistance and even the resumption of the U.S.-Palestinian dialogue have found an opportunity to stop the flow of assistance altogether. President Clinton's efforts to shore up support for Prime Minister Shimon Peres were widely praised in the U.S. 
and there was no resistance to the White House co-convening of an anti-terrorism summit or providing Israel with a new security-related technology and $100 million in a new anti-terrorism equipment. On the other hand, Arab Americans and all Arabs' efforts to secure White House and State Department support for some little humanitarian assistance to alleviate Palestinian suffering caused by the Israeli closure of the West Bank and Gaza have drawn little support, if any. While the administration knows that any initiatives taken to support Israel will receive congress, 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 excuse me, congressional approval. They argue that Congress would not be willing in an election year to enact any initiatives or a proposal to support the Palestinians. The president knows the depth of the humanitarian crisis in the Palestinian community and the danger that it portends for Palestinian support for the peace process. And he has indicated that he is deeply troubled, God, troubled by this situation. But White House and State Department aides have so far not been forthcoming in, in seriously challenging congressional obstruction in an effort to meet Palestinian needs. As Congress sounds more and more, my friend, like Likud, and the administration bureaucracy flounders and focuses solely on anti-terrorism measures, the mainstream American Jewish leadership has mirrored developments in Israel and apparently lost its zest for moving forward with a strong commitment to peace, while admitting disappointment and even depression over recent developments. Even some liberal American Jewish groups have called for a freezing of the uh, process, hoping to buy time until the end of the Israeli elections. So we are hostage to the Israeli and American ele uh, elections. Israel use of collective punishment, which violates norms of international human rights and law is counterproductive and it threatens the peace process as much as terrorism. Palestinian National uh, Authority efforts to find political solutions to their relationship with nonviolent opposition leadership should be always supported, and they are working very hard in that regard. There is an urgent need for job creation in the middle, in the West Bank and Gaza, to bring tangible benefits for peace to more Palestinian and to dry up the support base of anti peace extremism. Let me think, tell you something. If you need bread for your kids to feed them for that day, you're going to do the impossible to get that bread. You're not going to watch your kids dying because of no food. So jobs mean a lot. Improving the conditions of the Palestinian in the West Bank and Gaza means a lot for the Palestinian Authority, for Israel, for America, for the entire international community. We shall remain committed and the PNA shall remain committed to the Middle East peace process, despite all the difficulties and the tragedies of the past two and a half years. We are disappointed with the base and one-sided nature of its implementation. While the pressure is placed on Palestinians to implement the Oslo Accord, Israel continues to undermine those accords through new land confiscation, continues building settlements and security roads in the West Bank and falling, failing to implement agreements regarding prisoners, passages, and commerce. Nevertheless, we retain the hope that this process, if fulfilled, will lead to a just and lasting, lasting negotiated settlement between Israelis, Palestinians, and the broad Arab world. We should express our su support for the newly elected uh, president of the Palestinian National Authority, Yasser Arafat, and the Palestine Legislative Council. But we should be deeply concerned that recent Israeli measures threaten to undercut their legitimacy and credibility 
legitimacy and the credibility. Two key words. Despite those burdens, President Arafat and the PNA have preserved in their commitment to peace as the elected representative of the Palestinian people. They deserve greater respect and greater support from the U.S. administration, from the U.S. Congress in their efforts to rebuild the Palestinian economy, infrastructure, and civil society. While we understand efforts by the administration to restore Israeli confidence in their security and in the peace process, we are very alarmed that measures to similarity boost Palestinian confidence in the benefits of this process have not been a priority. We shall call all on the administration to establish as a priority the commitment articulated by Secretary, um, Secretary Christopher to the Sharm el-Sheikh on meeting on March to an emergency plan designed to improve the economic, economic situation in Gaza and the West Bank. We urge active and visible U.S. leadership in marshalling $100 million, which is not a lot, okay, to marshal $100 million in emerge emergency funds to provide immediate short-term public works employment to 100,000 Palestinians. Funds are available from a variety of international sources, and job creation programs can be administered in cooperation with the UN, Relief and Work Administration, or a number of respected U.S. and international non-governmental organization. At the same time, the administration must press Israel to ease the, their blockade and to allow access to the West Bank and Gaza through Jordan and Egypt. We express deep, or I express deep concern that tension in, this, in South Lebanon, which we didn't talk about, okay, again threatened to create a crisis for the people and governments of the Middle East and may undermine the comprehensive peace. We call on all Jewish leaders and Arab leaders who support the peace process to convene, okay, and to meet more often, to put together, okay, a plan that will be uh, creative in providing solution to remove the impediments that have thus far blocked the benefits of peace from being enjoyed by both the Israelis and the Arabs alike, and transform the political discourse in Congress from one marred by antagonism to one based on recognition that peace requires mutual reinforcement and mutual respect. And I really thank you very much.